Hi there folks, I'm Kevin Tracy of ktracy.com. In this week's video, I'm reviewing a cheap set of artist quality colored pencils from Hobby Lobby, speaking a little Chinese, creating patriotic and religious art based on an old World War II photo, discussing theology, and sharing the results of my research into Jesus' blood type. If you find yourself enjoying any of this, hit that like button and consider subscribing for more weird videos. Some of this video might seem a little jumpy, and that's because I've edited out a couple hours worth of footage where you can only see the back of my head in the camera. But if you buy any of my art from ktracy.com, I promise it'll go to getting a better camera set up. Anyway, let's get the show on the road. This video got started because one of my awesome nieces recently turned 10. Now that she's in double digits, which she's constantly reminding us about, and it's apparently a much bigger deal than I remember it being, she wants to graduate from kids' color pencils like Crayola to adult color pencils. She also still draws on herself with markers and lets her dog eat her art supplies, so she clearly isn't ready yet for an $80 set of Faber-Castell pencils. However, being the awesome uncle that I am, I went to Hobby Lobby to see if I could use a 40% off coupon and maybe find a deal for her. Well, what I did find were these generic artist quality colored pencils from the Fine Touch that were a fraction of the cost of the Prismacolor and Faber-Castell colored pencils. Whereas the professional name brand pencils were a little over $2 a piece, these are a mere 27 cents a piece, and at that price, I didn't really care if a few of them became dog food. And while these were in the adult art section, hmm, that sounds bad. Well, you know what I mean. I was a little worried that the kid would have taken one look at these and the generic packaging they were in and figured I got them from the dollar store or wish.com, so I bought two sets of these, one for her and one for me. Despite the fact that they were cheap, I wanted to prove to her that you could still create awesome art with them. And that's what I'm going to do in this week's video. Before I did that though, I needed to find out whether these pencils were actually any good or not. There are things that you simply cannot do with crappy colored pencils, and at 27 cents a piece, my expectations were pretty low. As I began swatching colors, the first thing I noticed was that the colors lacked any kind of a name. Now granted, I think the names are usually pretty stupid. like brick red or forest green. There are a lot of different tones to red bricks and green forests. It doesn't really tell you anything. However, having a title for the pencil is still an important thing so you know what color you're using when you pick up a pencil. So after swatching each color, I took the time to write a generic color code and number on each pencil. Y for yellow, O for orange, R for red, BR for brown, P for purple, B for blue, and G for green. The numbers were just nominal, assigned in the order that they were swatched. If I end up liking these, I might actually go back and change the number assignments to kind of group the hues together a bit closer, especially in the greens, purples, and blues where there was a healthy amount of variation. There was also one cool gray pencil that was probably supposed to be a silver, a warm gray, and a neutral gray. There was also a white and black, the latter of which is distinguished with a white, the fine touch logo embedded at the top of the pencil wood instead of black. And while we're talking about color assignments, I feel I should bring up that while the colors are not identified by name, the color painted onto the wood is generally fairly accurate. It seems like they switched the paint on two of the pairs of pencils though. The ones I marked as B2 and B3 seemed reversed, as well as the ones I marked as B4 and B5. Nailed it! Can you believe that was my first time trying to speak Chinese? I know, probably not, but I promise it's true. Okay, after swatching and labeling all the pencils, I next decided to test them out by blending and layering. And you know what? They actually did a really good job. I was pretty impressed. Blending similar hues, like light blue to dark blue, worked wonderfully, and the pencils layered wonderfully over contrasting colors too, like red and blue. These do feel a little bit waxy, but not as much as kids coloring pencils that I've used in the past, and I felt like these layered and blended about as well as any pencil I've ever tried. In fact, blending within hues here was easier than some of the cheaper alcohol-based markers that I've used in the past. I was actually pretty impressed with the quality of this dog food from the fine touch I bought from my niece. I wanted to draw something easy, and this was the 2nd of July, so I was thinking something patriotic. 
I started looking for ideas online when I stumbled across this photograph of a priest saying mass aboard a naval warship during World War II. It wouldn't be easy, but this appealed to me for a couple of reasons. First was the challenge. As you may have noticed in my pixel art, I tend to get lost in the details of my work. I spent two days drawing the stained glass window in the background of my Ghostbusters print. The same is true of what I call my analog art, and it's not a good thing. Especially with machinery and faces, I have a terrible tendency to focus too much on the details and not enough on the structure. This photo features details too small to be accurately drawn by a pencil on this 9 by 12 inch page, both of the warship and the men aboard it. The second reason was that when I draw, my mind enters a kind of meditative state. My art is influenced by what I'm meditating on, and my meditation is influenced by what I'm creating. Anyway, this was a rare chance for me to spend several hours just meditating on the Holy Mass and the Eucharist and the beauty of these gifts, our relationship to them, and their relationship to us. Now, I'm not trying to get all religious on you here. I, I know some people get offended by this stuff, and I'm sorry if you do. However, as a Catholic, these are very important topics to me, and it should be expected that my art is, from time to time, going to be influenced by things that are important and meaningful to me. So, to understand some of my artistic choices and motivations here, I am going to explain just the very basics of the Eucharist and the Catholic Mass to clear up any misconceptions that may exist for non-Catholics or, as was my case several, until several years ago, Catholics who were just catechized very poorly. I promise it'll be fast. As Catholics, we believe that when Jesus said, Take, eat, this is my body, and take, drink, this is my blood, that he literally meant this is my body and this is my blood. He also told us to do this in remembrance of him and hence the Mass. We also believe that this is hugely significant because Jesus went on to say that those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. I know a lot of people who take every word of the Bible literally, except for these. And to be honest, I can't blame them. I mean, at face value, it really is kind of creepy. Hey, look, I, I wanted to thank you for being so great to me. So, I baked your pie. Oh, wow. Hey, that looks delicious. Mm, oh, this is good. What's in there? Well, there's some apples and some cinnamon and my hair. What? My hair is in the pie, Brian. And now it's inside of you. Part of me is inside of you, Brian. Do you feel me, Brian? Do you feel me inside of you? Kind of really creepy, actually. I mean, this is the God who told his chosen people to circumcise themselves, so there's kind of a track record here, but ritual cannibalism? That's a whole other level of creepy in my book. And that's pretty much what I thought as an eight-year-old kid when I first had this explained to me. So eventually I was confirmed in the church through the religious education program, always just believing that this is just a figurative sort of thing that people made a really big deal of. Anyway, several years later, in 2007, Pope Benedict authorized the use of the Latin rites for Mass, and a church a few parishes away from me in my home in Virginia was one of the first in the country to offer it. I was curious what all the hubbub was about, so I went. And three things really st stuck with me about this Mass. The first was that my grandfather, who had died a few months earlier, from the moment I walked in this church, felt like he was there with me. I actually looked next to me a few times just to check because it's, it, the feeling was just so strong. And I had been to services before this, after he had passed away, and I was thinking about him a lot, but this is just different somehow. The second thing I remember was that even though the Mass was said in Latin, I knew exactly what was going on because I knew the Mass in English. Finally, there was the priest's sermon about the Eucharist, which was in English. He not only emphasized the literal meaning of the scripture passages I mentioned before, but he also talked about the implications of us literally eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the living and divine Jesus Christ. He explained that because God, and therefore Jesus, exists beyond the limits of space and time, that when we eat his flesh and abide in him and him in us, we are entering a sort of vortex of space and time and becoming not just unified with Christ, but 
with those other souls who are also united in Christ at this moment of the sacrifice throughout the past, present, and future. It's a literal union of the community of believers in a single instance spread throughout the ongoing history of the church. And I know I'm not doing this idea or even the priest's sermon justice in my explanation of it, but from the moment he said the word vortex, everything, I don't know, just kind of clicked. And I instantly understood why it felt like my grandfather was there in that church with me. This was the first time I really understood what the Eucharist was, and my grandfather, who was there at my first communion as a child when I had no idea what was going on, was at this, which may more correctly be described as my real first communion. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know that took longer than expected, but the reason I went through all of that, though, is because it directly influenced this piece of art. The photo wasn't detailed enough for me to make out the uniforms of everyone on board, but I decided to draw them with a mixture of Army, Navy, and Marine dress and combat uniforms. I felt like the black and white photo gave me liberty to make my own decisions about colors and uniforms, and the idea of servicemen from different branches in a wide variety of uniforms, if actually inaccurate, made sense in the rendering of the mass, bringing together men with drastically different roles in this vortex of space and time created by them eating the flesh of Jesus Christ. I also liked how the idea of this happening on the deck of a naval warship implied that soldiers and marines were about to stage an amphibious landing. Here these men were, coming together before some, maybe many of them, were about to die, finding solace and peace in the comfort of their God. There's also a purely military message in this piece of art, showing men with the differing uniforms and highlighting their different roles that men took in military service, all united in this moment in the single goal of achieving their victory on the battlefield, which is just moments away, perhaps. I actually thought about adding a couple of airmen on this ship, or soldiers with more modern combat uniforms. However, I felt that it would have been a little bit too distracting from the messages I wanted to convey with this rendering. It may have even been a bit garish, and I also kind of worried that it might have been a bit self-serving since I did serve in the Air Force. I might do something in the future more focused on this Vortex thing in the Eucharist, but for this piece it just didn't feel quite appropriate. I think it would have subtracted too harshly from the subtlety of the message, and I wanted people to appreciate the use of color here. At the center of the mass, there's an invisible but brilliant warm golden light, and around the ship, cold dreary clouds made beautiful almost through the presence of Christ. And the warship itself, a machine of death and destruction constructed of cold steel and iron, reflecting both the warmth of those Christians aboard and the damp cool sky. Though it towers over the men, it is at the same time faint and somewhat faded into the background for it is ultimately only a tool, neither good nor evil by itself, hence the contrasting light sources. I made an exception for the deck of the ship though. Using a variety of colors, I wanted to give the impression of the deck being like a red carpet for the soldiers, sailors, and marines at this mass. A few years ago, I began wondering what Jesus' blood type was. I think it had something to do with my sister needing a kidney donation, and in the process, the doctors explained that type A can only donate to type A or AB, type B to type B or AB, type AB can accept a donation from anyone, but can only donate to itself, and type O can donate to anyone, but can only accept a donation from another type O. Anyway, I figured if there was any kind of coincidental religious message to be inferred from Jesus' blood type, it would be type O because he gave himself universally for all of us. I figured someone had to do this test in the Shroud of Turin, which many people claim is the burial cloth of Jesus and is stained with his dried blood. Well, this actually turned into a whole research project on my part. And they did the test and it was type AB, although they couldn't say definitively whether it was positive or negative because the RH molecules, science stuff, whatever. Anyways, uh, <laughs> but it, it turned out that there was actually a lot more evidence supporting this uh, AB blood type. They did a similar test on a separate burial cloth used with the Shroud of Turin, and it too featured AB blood. And as my research continued, I ended up learning about what the church calls Eucharistic miracles, where the communion wafer, having been consecrated and, at least we believe, transformed into the physical flesh of Jesus Christ, and then spoiled in one way or another, actually manages to transform itself, either partially or entirely, into a piece of bloody mass tissue. And that, that's not, like, figuratively or, you know, Catholics believe. It, it's physically right there. You can see it. The Catholic Church commonly nowadays sends these to secular, non-religious forensic laboratories to confirm whether or not they're a legitimate miracle and worthy of belief. 
And in each case that's not a hoax, the tissue turns out to be part of a human heart and the blood type is AB. The cool thing about this is that some of the samples sent for testing, including the shroud, date back to times before anyone knew what blood types were. So if there was a conspiracy over several centuries to manufacture these things, the organizers must have had some sort of divine help in making it happen, especially since AB is present in only about 5% of the human population. But as silly and inconsequential as researching Jesus' blood type might be in the grand scheme of our salvation, I couldn't help but think that perhaps AB is more fitting in a way than type O. Type AB was the universal receiver. I'm reminded of that old painting of Jesus outside some house knocking on its wooden door. However, the wooden door doesn't have a handle on the outside, implying that it can only be opened by whoever's on the inside. In other words, Jesus invites us all to join him, but it's up to us to accept that invitation. Or to put it another way, to be received by him. And it is silly because I know now that blood plasma donations appear to work exactly the opposite way as organ donations, and I didn't know that 10 minutes ago, but I was thinking that while I was working on this piece. Oh man, I'm really good at tangents today. Anyway, I wanted to the deck of the ship to look almost like a red carpet running out to the men aboard and the viewer of the piece, welcoming them to the mass and inviting them to be received by Jesus. I mentioned before that this piece would challenge me not to get wrapped up in the technical details of what I was drawing, and that was certainly true. Uh, there were a lot of details, including the rivets of the ship, that I really wanted to add, but I knew they would distract from the mass, which I wanted to be the main focus of this piece. Another challenge was deciding whether or not I wanted to use black colored pencil to add contrast. When I started, and really up until I was using the black, my gut reaction was to avoid it. I've been experimenting lately using different hues for shadows lately, like dark blues and purples and browns and dark greens, and it was creating some really cool effects when they were layered together. However, as this work continued, it began to feel like it was just all getting too washed out, and the mass was almost blending into the background a bit. By adding black, it made the highlights of the invisible golden light source really pop out a lot more. I think it was a really good decision. I used it sparingly in the background of the warship that they were on, in only the darkest of areas like inside the gun turrets and in some really dark shadows. I also used it lightly to add some dimension to the bottom of the turret. And I think the final challenge of any artwork, at least for me, is knowing when to stop. But for this piece, it was actually pretty simple. According to my phone, I spent about 14 hours drawing this, meditating about the beauty of the Eucharist, its importance, and what it means to me. And after 14 hours, it just felt like my meditation was over. And when I looked down, the art looked finished to me. So I signed my name at the bottom of it, and that was that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm sorry if the theology stuff was off-putting at all. I wasn't trying to convince you of anything as much as I was trying to help you understand the inspirations and motivations of my creation process, specifically for this piece. If you do want to learn more about Catholicism or you have any major critiques about our faith, there are about 2,000 years worth of resources created by people far smarter than me who can help you. Many of them are still alive today and putting content on the internet for free. Well, let me know what you think. Is it a miracle that I got this quality out of a generic set of 48 colored pencils from Hobby Lobby? Personally, I'm kind of thinking these are just a shockingly good deal. And should I never try speaking a foreign language again? Or would you prefer if I just shut up and play the same royalty-free music over a time-lapse video? Well, leave a comment below letting me know what you liked or didn't like. Smash that like button, and if you want to see more content like this, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I try to post one new video every week, and I'd love it if you joined our growing community. Hey, 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 before you go, the video on the left is a time-lapse of me drawing my Irish Wheaton Terrier mix using a generic set of water-based brush markers from Hobby Lobby. And on the right is a video that YouTube thinks you'll like based on their nerdy computer science stuff. Anyways, folks, thanks again for watching.